Right, I'm very honored again to be here. And uh, uh, I've been uh, in here, I think, twice or thrice for the CBT. Uh, it's a very, very special family uh, that teaches um, kingdom business. It teaches servant leadership in one fold. And like you have heard um, at Intercessors for Uganda, I am the overseer for, for that department. It's called Leadership Development, where um, Africa Kingdom Business Forum uh, falls. It's, it's doing business God's way. Um, we realize that church is more in the marketplace than in the four walls. So you'd call me I'm a, a marketplace minister, so to speak, and then also servant leadership in there. Um, Let's pray before we begin. Our loving and heavenly Father, we are indeed indebted to you. This is a new day, and you promise new mercies every single new day. Righteousness and justice come from your throne. But the Bible also says that truth and mercy goes before you. We are grateful that we are here under your mercies. For if you are to judge fairly, no one would really qualify. But because of your mercies that are new, we are here and spared. And we have this hope, the hope that will cause us to live out our assignments, that you apportioned each one of us while we are still here on earth. Now I pray specifically for myself as a vessel through which you are using this morning. I am not qualified better than everybody, but I know that there is a message through which you want to pass. And I am praying that I speak the words that you want me to speak, only that that is important and relevant. I also ask the Holy Spirit, who teaches us in all truths, to break down the message into its simplest form for each one of us to partake. Thank you for serving us this meal. Jesus, you make it possible. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Right, so I will begin. I asked um, the media team, I don't know whether you're ready to do my slides. Um, I'm very comfortable with using slides for one reason. Yeah, I'm visual. Um, yeah, I did industrial graphics art at Mercury University many years ago. So I have so much of visual things that I do, even in my teaching calling. I'm also glad to see one of my students here. She's now much older. She told me she's finished school. Uh, one of the Wabasa daughters, I'm happy to see that she's grown um, and she's even ministering at this wonderful church. I've been at DC, Mark Hill, and I think DC, Mbarara. I had never visited here. Priscilla, thank you for making this happen. Can you imagine? It took, it took a Kenyan <laughs> to make me come here. But I know wonderful things that are happening at this in Zambia. I know a lot of friends from here. Pastor Sam Wabasa himself, we've been doing ministry together for a long time. So I'm glad that I've come at DC. In fact, this is even bigger than the other DCs. Yeah, it's much bigger. So uh, we I'm talking about, I, get, I was given a topic, metamorphor, uh, transform to transform. And there's an illustration of a cycle of, of a very interesting creature called a butterfly. Yeah, there you go. Um, if you can reduce the lights a bit so that um, the, the, the PowerPoint is a little, the contrast is, comes out better, you can reduce the lights a bit. From an egg, and then there's a destructive part, which is the caterpillar. Sometimes it's even very, very harmful. You know, uh, and many people have a phobia for caterpillars. But then there's a time it goes into a dormant stage. You might think that it's dead. It's in a cocoon, alive in there, 
very, very miraculously, God provides the food. It's inside a cocoon for as long as God determined. You might think it's dead, but out of that comes a very wonderful butterfly. And I know all of us love butterflies. Okay, I want to believe we do because they are harmless. But can you imagine a very destructive, scary creature in a caterpillar forming into a very attractive butterfly? And you know, butterflies help in pollination. The fruit that you eat, you know, the butterfly do a lot of work to pollinate, to, to make sure that they, they are productive. So that is the genius of God. From the stages, egg, larva, which is the caterpillar, and then the pupa is the, the dormant stage, and then transformed into a very useful, attractive butterfly. So I'm just going to use that illustration in line with our theme of, of this forum, transform to transform. Um, the transforms there are, are double. There's a transform because we all, without our credentials or qualifications, God transformed us when he bought us. You know, from the land of slavery, from bondage, and we have come to his marvelous light, from darkness into his marvelous light. So we were transformed from darkness to light. But there comes the responsibility. Once we've been transformed, we ought to be transformed. And I'll be talking about that quite so much. Um, and as Pablo also touched on some of the doctrines we believe in, that once saved, always saved. It's like someone says, once transformed, always transformed, but that's not the case. God transforms us from darkness to light so that we start walking a journey of faith, a journey of, of witnessing to the rest that it works this way, so you better come. So the overview is uh, in just five parts. I uh, will do an introduction, uh, and then I'll introduction just defining what metamorphosis means or transformation. And then we shall talk about that faith in action is the best way to transform, especially in our context here. And then I shall talk about the marketplace. The marketplace is the best ground for transformation. And then the practical bit would be Christian-inspired practices for transformation. So I'm just going to take us through that journey uh, to see why you being transformed from darkness to light, God wants you to not to stay there, but also you need for to transform. When God saves us, when God saves us, um, I'll be using Luganda, but I'll also try to get it back here because sometimes it makes a lot of sense. When God saves us, now in Luganda, we sometimes we use words that change black. I think it's with every many languages. As tender as it might, but it must break through the ground so that it sprouts and then it's able to be fruitful. That's how we are supposed to be. We die to self. And then we ought to sprout out. And we thank God that the grace of God makes that much, much possible. And the hope of God. Right. And another scripture on the next slide. Um, in Romans 5.17, it says, For if by one man offense, death reigned by one. That's Adam the first. Okay. Yeah, the, f yeah, the first Adam. And much more... They which receive abundance of grace and, and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. That's Jesus Christ who is the last Adam. So there are two Adams in this symbolism. The first Adam, the literal Adam, and then the last Adam who came to make amends for what the first Adam had done. So this change that Paul is talking about here cannot be manufactured. You can't download it from Glovo. Glove is an app where we ask for food and other things. You cannot download it. It's not AI, meta AI. No, you can't manipulate it. 
in our power or our means. So I will say that the part of the process of someone who is saved, you're going to go into the wilderness. And sometimes the wilderness always comes if God wants to raise you to another level. In fact, that's, how, that's what happens. For you to go to another level, there's supposed to be some bit of discomfort. That's the pupa stage. That's the more like redundant and having a lot of questions. So you cannot short circuit these things. You are being served. The change is going to come. God is going to come and start pruning. John 15 talks about uh, Jesus saying that he's the vine with the branches. His father is the gardener. Uh, he comes into his garden at free will whenever he wants to come. And when he comes, he is able to prune. In fact, you can see, oh, this branch, which is in my son's vine, now that's you and me, they are not productive. So he cuts you off and dusts you away, throws you away. And then there are also some branches. To him, they are potential. So this one will produce more fruit if I only prune a bit. So he prunes you. Even pruning is discomforting, but for the better. So for me, I'm concentrating on that part of pruning. Pruning is part of the process for you to be productive. Some of you are farmers. You already know what I'm talking about. If you don't prune, your crops cannot yield to your expectation. So God, like for example, the caterpillar may have desire to fly, but until it goes through the God design and created process of metamorphosis, it has no power to take to the skies. It has to be redundant for the process that God chose. It cannot even choose that time. And I'm going to be a pupa for this long. No, it doesn't even know in its little brain. That's all determined by God. It's certainly different with us. That because God created us and he has our manual and he has our assignment, he's going to take us through all of these stages. The question is, are you willing? The question is, are you following him? The next slide says, but while God's first goal for us is that immediate and instantaneous change. You know when he says, I explain being saved, that's instantaneous. It's a fire. And someone comes and takes you out of the fire. That's what Jesus does. You are saved. And then you don't stay at the cross, at the foot of Jesus. Remember even Jesus told his mother and John, you know what, Ma woman, that's your son. Son, that's your mother. Go away. But I tell you, most of us, when we get saved, we want to stay at the foot of the cross. That's not what Jesus intended. If, if, in fact, if you also go by the symbolism of when they were still in Egypt, you told them, get a lamb free of defects, uh, one year old, something like that. Keep it for all these many days, but then you'll cut it, uh, spread the, 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 the blood on the lintels of the door, on the doorposts. Because the angel will pass by in the night and it will strike all of those households without that blood. What happened? That very night, the Bible says, in, at the stroke of midnight, the angel of death came. But you see, they never stayed in their houses because the, the doorposts have blood, because it's a safe haven. In fact, God told them, get on your feet, strap your saddles. In fact, he told them he eats unleavened bread. He didn't have even time for the bread to leaven with bitter herbs and start on the journey. And I tell you, if you've read that story, that journey was not easy. Many of them died. Did God save them? He did. But actually, many didn't make it on the other end. Now, that middle part is what we are talking about here. It is a do or die, but it has so much on your part, intentionality, for you to choose what to do and what not to do. So these changes can take place rapidly or gradually. If you see the case of Apostle Paul, his change was instantaneous, and in a few times, he, the man was on fire. But then there are all those like Peter that they had to take a bit of rebirth, reboot to understand this kingdom message that Jesus was talking about. So that happens with all of us. You can be saved and your change can be instant or a bit more rapid than the other, or it can be a slow, gradual process. Depending on God, but also on your willingness 
to obey his word. Old habits, old patterns of life that, that we developed before salvation, they're not easy to go away. But, my, but by now they should be replaced by new patterns fashioned by our conformity to God's image. And that's the process of change. There is a liberation. There is an intentionality. If you don't, you will be, it will, it will be a long process. And naturally, the next slide said, naturally we resist change. Our brains, I've read some biological scientific researches. You know, the brain takes, if, if it's captured something for a long time, it's very resistant to any change. Just think about even fasting. If you've been eating for all of the 364 days, and then you choose to fast the, the last one, it's going to be a tough decision. You'll get headaches. You'll have excuses. You'll say, maybe my doctor would advise that I, 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 I eat in the middle of the fast. But that's actually the brain. It usually takes long to adjust. So it is with our patterns. Because we have been sold in them, they cannot gradually go, rather instantaneously go away. So we need to hinge in the Lord's word so that we start taking off all of those one at a time. God wants us to change daily so that we are equipped to do his will and have spiritual vigor to accomplish his work. I've been sharing this previously, but I also share it here. We get saved and start on the journey of being born again, not to receive blessings from God. Now, I know this can disturb some of our doctrines. We don't get saved and be born again to get blessings from God. That's, that's bonus. The Bible says, cut on a thousand hills. All of the privileges, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So God has no problem with blessings. But the reason why he makes you and me saved is so that we are transformed into his image. And that takes a daily process. I was going to say daily painful, but that also depends at what stage you are at. God saves us so that we are transformed into the image of his son, known to get blessings. If I know some of you have tried it. I have ever tried it. If you get saved because you, you get a transaction out of it, you know, someone tells you, when you do this, you do that. Even with our fasting, if you fast 10, 21 days, on the 22nd, God is going to do this. I know some of you have been frustrated. That's not how God works. He says, seek ye first my kingdom and righteousness. And what will be added to you? All things will be added. So do that first so that because you're seeking him, not because of what he's going to give you. It can be very frustrating. If you've not done that before, please don't do it. I've done it. It doesn't work. The next point there, uh, transformation is faith in action. And there are two scriptures there that I quoted. Uh, let's read them together. I think you can read them. Uh, James 2.14 2, says, 1, 2, 3, we read. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Now, James, if you study a bit of his history, He's actually stepbrother to Jesus Christ. Um, I say stepbrother intentionally because he was one of the children born to Joseph and Mary after Jesus' birth. And even in his address and introduction, he say, I'm the brother of my Lord. Of course, he has that humility, but it, it's one of those episodes that have tough language. And for me, I understand why. Probably he got saved a little later because in John 7, we are told that even his brothers didn't believe in him. But now we see a man who has a bit of vigor, of emphasis. His words are a little tough, like I think First Peter or something. Okay? But he is making a point. When you say you are saved and that God has saved you and you are proving this to your old family, they must see that change in you that you're saved. 
If you're coming from a very poor family, your salvation should lead to wealth. And that's going to take you to tap from the wisdom that Pastor Sam has been talking about here. Applying knowledge and understanding. If you say you are saved and you're coming from a line of, 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 of uh, genetic illnesses and all, you come and stand in the gap and say, you know what? The man that I serve can heal this. So all of this call for a deliberation and standing in, in alignment with what God is telling us to do. So James is generally telling that if you say you have faith and there's no action, so that faith is dead. It's not working. There ought to be action. I've also met some uh, gener gen generous, hyper-grace people who say, no, you don't need action for your faith because now you render Jesus powerless. Uh, you can't save yourself by your own actions. I'm like, you know, I think you're applying two things in two different places. No one needs works to be saved. But after we are saved, we need to engage in, our, in works. That's what it means. We need to engage. That's why Paul says, I have fought the good fight. I've run my race. Now what awaits me is the, is the crown of righteousness for what I have done. And not only for me, but also to all of you on that day. In verse 18, he says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And he says, show me your faith without your works and I'll show you my faith by my works. So your faith, the one you saw of Jesus Christ, Jesus does not want to save dummy people who are just shouting on Friday nights and, and um, while the political arena is satiated by all sorts of weirdos or in the economy has all sorts of witches or in the education sector has all sorts of all of these things that are going on. He saves you so that you occupy these places. That's the faith in action. He didn't come to save you to take you to heaven. You think he was bored? I don't think he was. At the time I asked some young children, um, I asked them a question, do you think God needs you in heaven? They're like, yeah, right, God needs us. And of course, it's with so much teachings that we, even the songs we sing, you know, you left heaven because you couldn't do it without us, so you came down here. So it looks like God, Jesus is so needy, yet actually he saved us so that we occupy, we become like him. Not because he was looking for company. The Bible says he has innumerable angels. That that's sounds like good company. But he saved us so that we be like him and we move and, and act. The Bible says when he comes back for the thousand year rule, we are going to reign with him as kings and priests. The rehearsal starts now. You cannot start being a king on the day you are appointed, you are groomed to be one like by being a prince or a princess. You cannot go on the battlefront as a normal soldier without doing the drills. So God serves us. He puts us in the drill department. This is the life we are living. All of this is going to culminate into being kings and priests when he comes back. And we are, the Bible says you are going to reign with him. So what skill are you going to put on the table, for example? Ask your neighbor, what skill are you going to put on the table when the Lord returns to reign a thousand years? What skill? Have you actually noticed that the people in the secular world, if they are focused on one skill, however bad it might sound in our religious eyes, they are good at it. But you look for believers. You ask them, what skill do you know that this is you? When they mention it, you come. They'll start scratching their heads because they don't know. So of what help are you going to be in this a thousand year kingdom? Which territory is God, Jesus going to give you? Have you read about the parable of the talents? That's actually about us. He's gone. He's given us gifts. We ought to use them multiply. He expects a profit. 
So he comes back and says, okay, I gave you 10. Oh, you gave me 10, I have 20. Well done, servant. Oh, you know, you gave me one. I know, you know, you're tough. You know, I know you reap where you did not sow. I know I buried it. He said, take it from him. Give it to the one who has more and throw him where there's gnashing of teeth. That parable is about believers, not unsaved people. In fact, most of Jesus' parables are addressing saved people. Sometimes when we read them, we just say, ah, those are for the people who are not yet saved. He said, you have been saved. You've been given a gift of salvation. He's going to come back and ask you to balance books. So ask your neighbor again, what do you bring on the table when Jesus Christ returns? You better start. If you didn't know, please start knowing what you're going to do. And that God has given us clues by the gifts that he has given us. Some of us are very good with numbers. There's going to be mathematicians in his kingdom. Some of us are good with IT. There's going to be all of that. It's not just being on a pulpit here. Some of us are good with, um, with administration, with accounts. Are you good at your accountancy? Are you good at your administration? And actually you can tell by the reports of the people, okay? Especially those that you're trying to serve. Because if you're, if you're bad, you will actually have a feeling that people don't appreciate that. So the marketplace ministry is... For me, I see it as the ground. When Jesus says in Luke 19 that occupy until I come, he is not saying occupy your home or your church, but says spread out at the uttermost ends of the earth. Have dominion as my elect until I return. He's coming back. And by the way, he's coming back in person. It's not a metaphor. He's coming back in person. We will be able to touch him. Some of you will be able to shake his hands or even embrace him. Okay? So he's coming back. But he says, before I come, occupy. Have dominion. We can pray all night. But after the prayer, we go and occupy and have dominion. So the marketplace is that best place. The mountain, the spheres of life. And marketplace ministry, uh, in my definition there, is the missional role of Christians as God's redemptive agents. We have a kingdom in heaven, so we all are ambassadors here on earth. You are ambassador in your ministry of lands. You are an ambassador in the ministry of internal affairs or in education or whichever place. Meaning, you only do things sanctioned and endorsed by the one who sent you, the king. And that's exactly what he's going to ask of you when he returns. So the ministry, the marketplace ministry is about that. We act as salt of the earth to add tests, to preserve, but also the light because the parts of the world out there are full of darkness. So when you take the light, you are God's agent. You are an ambassador, a disciple maker in obedience to both the great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and strength. That is a, sum, a summary. And then they say the next one is as good as it is. Love your neighbor as yourself. But then the great commission is go out and make disciples. Such a very beautiful arena. But God is, Jesus is saying on a Sunday, go out and make disciples of men. So by the time you come back here, there's something written in your books in heaven that you see from Monday 28th to Saturday 2nd, my sister, Joan, did ABC. And that was really in line with her script, with her assignment. That is making disciples and Jesus commissioned us for that one. So actually the great commission is not to convert people but to disciple them. Did you know that? I have been a part of a congregation where the focus is much more on converting people. There's no bad in that. In fact, people getting saved, we don't even, it's not even us who save them anyway. God will save them. Like that thief on the cross. Who preached to him? You know? But Jesus is so much concerned about discipleship. 
Discipleship is learning and applying what you have learned and following in a certain discipline. In fact, it comes from a name, from a term discipline. Disciple comes from discipline. You are disciplined a certain way of how you walk. Jesus is more concerned about disciples than converts. Now, that sounds very controversial, but I'll, I'll defend it. He's more concerned about disciples than converts. That's why I gave you the, this, the symbol of when the, the angel of death passed over their houses. Those guys were converted. God saved them. But he had to take them through the wilderness to discipline them. And I tell you, no one loves discipline. Okay, oftentimes we don't. And many died. So the making of disciples is God's agenda. And that means you, with the gift that God has given you, you're going to put it to use. Why is the marketplace the best ground for transformation? There in the corner is a picture of one of those old churches. But there's just a guy in St. I don't know whether it was a, a Friday morning. It's, it's worse if it's a Sunday morning and the only one guy sitting in the pews. But that's, this is what's happening in the Western world. Churches are becoming bars. People no longer go to church. You know, for all the reason. Now, I have some statistics here. Now, the marketplace is the best ground because, number one, they're about seven, because almost all non-Christians are in the marketplace. So if you're looking for a harvest, a bountiful harvest, it's in the marketplace because almost all non-Christians are out there. And the statistics there say less than 30% of men in Africa attend church regularly. And especially if it is praying overnight. Maybe the statistics even come lower. I can find it's just 5% of the congregation. I don't know what went wrong with the men, probably. Here we have quite a, a big representation. We are grateful to God. And I believe God is doing a new thing. And on other continents, like Europe, the percentages are much lower. And if you are to go by this current rate, regular church attendance is projected to drop to 11.17% by 2050. That's quite a drop. Now, if you're looking to transform people who come to church, that's a, a lost mission already. People are out there. So all our um, harvest is out in the marketplace. And the good news is that these people who aren't attending church, every day they wake up to go and open their shop, to open their business, to enter that office. And they even work alongside us. So that's a very great ground for us to do our discipleship, for us to be the salt, to be the light, to lead to transformation. Number two, whereas Almost all non-Christians don't come to church, but also, or they're in the marketplace, but also almost all Christians are in the marketplace. At least 85% of the Christian workforce spends 60 to 70% of their hours in the marketplace. And in addition to serving our families and our local churches, the marketplace is the primary context in which our spiritual gifts should be used. I, I read a book by um, Sandy Adelaja, a pastor who made a very big church in Ukraine. Uh, church shift. It's, it actually shifted my thinking. And uh, I don't sit for, for whoever wants to read to understand what Jesus meant by the Great Commission. We come to church here to be serviced. So he says, and in fact, you being an usher in a church or a singer, okay, that is not necessarily your ministry. That is housekeeping. I'll say that again. Being an usher in a very beautiful auditorium like this is not a ministry. That is housekeeping. It's like if you came home, okay, to my home, 
And then my wife gets you a cup of tea and some snacks. You don't say that that's her mean. She's doing ministry. She's housekeeping. She's supposed to do that in normal practice. But the ministry is what we do outside the confines of the walls. That's the ministry. Usher rings are very, ushers are very important. And all of these other things we do in house. But the ministry is what happens outside the walls. And that's what we are here about. That's the transformation. Because that ministry, you, you don't want to transform the people who have come to church by taking them wherever they want to go. But you want to transform the communities where we work, the communities where we stay. So ministry is what goes on outside the four walls of. I said I read that in church shift, but I also ascribed to it. I, I, I subscribe to that uh, philosophy. Number three, discipleship actually can happen in the marketplace. The potential for discipleship and ministry investment in a weekly service is a fraction, a little fraction of what is possible during an entire work week spent with our co-workers and clients. On a Sunday morning, usually a church as big as this, they can have like three services or four. Every service is about one and a half hours and you go away. But from Monday to sometimes Saturday, you are meeting people. So the fraction of Sunday, you can't compare it for the rest of the days. So if you're actually on a mission of discipling, it's easier with the other rest of the days than just these two hours on a Sunday morning. Marketplace as the best ground. Number four, the marketplace is a more authentic showroom of Christianity. More authentic showroom. And I said authentic in a sense because oftentimes you have a bit of hypocrisy. We, put, we are very superficial. You know, people on Sunday, uh, traditional churches, I know this is not that traditional. You know, we look very humble. We look very somber until you go to an environment where people don't know you. Start speaking things. So in the marketplace, it's, 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 it's the platform or the ground where we can be more authentic. I worked in downtown uh, for about five years. I have a friend who had a very big export-import business, so I was part of the team. And downtown, like real downtown Kampala, I would say maybe like 7 or 80% of the business is there. Can unapologetically say they are Muslim. And I'm using those words deliberate. Probably the statistics would have changed. But you can find a Hassan and all of these people. And, and, and with them, one of the first things they do when they get a shop to, to work in or to work at is supposed to be a special room for their prayers. And if they don't have it, they don't, are not afraid to put a mat in the corridors and do their prayers every stroke of their watch. But now, compare that on the other side. If, if you meet your long friend whom you know you saved and you're in Kampala, and say, oh, James, praise the Lord. Just start first, say, oh, who is this one, you know? Because we usually don't want to, especially if people around us know that we're not even saved. So if someone says, praise the Lord, like, ah, people now start saying, hey, even this one is saved. Oh, the whole time. Because we act in church. The marketplace is the authentic place to really show our real salvation. By living what we say we are. I know um, I have a, a title of pastor since I was in high school. You can imagine that. I think I'll talk about that. And usually I tell people, you know what? I'm not a pulpit pastor anymore. I am, I'm, I'm more comfortable with marketplace minister because that's what I do now. But, but, but from my high school, they called me a eh, pastor. So I go to university, they called me the same title. And um, uh, 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 so I've grown through that. Even where, when I used to work in downtown, every time I go back, they know I'm pastor. Why am I saying that? Not because I am, I'm the standard, but there are certain things that these people would see I would do. 
And you know, everything that you do and people say, hey, you are godly and you're a man, you become a pastor. And that's why that, that title can go every place, you know, pastor, pastor, what? What I'm trying to say is, let, what, let us talk, walk the talk in the marketplace. The marketplace is the best ground to, 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 to talk, to walk that talk. I'm saved and it should show. Number five, the marketplace forces the church to use of all its capabilities. We need to approach the marketplace ministry in a way that leverages the spiritual gifts of all Christians in the marketplace. I've already shown you that. When we, we reduce gifts to singing, to ushering, to being a uh, PA to pastor, we are actually reducing our capacity to serve. Gifts are in teaching, gifts are in accounts, gifts are in math, gifts are in technology, all of that. And the marketplace gives you that platform. The church may not have the capacity to hold all of that, but the marketplace does. The marketplace needs good accountants, it needs good teachers, it needs good administrators, it needs all of those a church would even tell you we only have places of vacancies for five people. So not all church churchcomers will, will have those vacancies. But out there, several of them. So it, forced, it forces the church to use all of the capabilities, the gifts that the people who come to church have. Quickly, number six, denominational divisions are less destructive in the marketplace. Here, there are always questions, which church do you come from, who is your pastor, and so on and so forth. Because you usually want to judge people according to where they go to church. Who, who's, I remember there's a time I had taken a break from attending church, and that was part of my pupa stage, you know. Um, I, I took about six months or thereabout without attending church. Very deliberate. Uh, but you see, while I was at that, I would be invited to speak online or physical. And some will ask you, you know, they want to judge you by where you go to church. Okay? So which church do you go to? And I will tell them, the church of Christ. Say, so, oh. Meanwhile, that church of Christ was not even existent. But you see, <laughs> church of Christ ministries. You know, we, we usually want to, to grade people according to who is their, what's their church? Who is their pastor? I tell you, please take off that prejudice. You respect a person by how God has put them before you. and uh, how, Because we are only vessels. No one knows it all. No one could ever say, I know A to Z. Nobody. Nobody. Even your favorite prophet. No. They have a limitation. So the marketplace takes all of those masks off. It's not about which denomination. I've, I've been invited to Christian fellowships in the marketplace. And that's, those are some of the battles. Who is coming? Is he from our church? Is he? And I'm like, guys, you don't know the battle you have here. You have the same devil. The devil does not respect your denominations. And also, a bit of consolation. In Jesus' kingdom, we're not going to have churches, by the way. Okay? That should be your consolation. We're not going to have churches. Ministry, AntonyMinistries.com or Limited. Nothing like that. So th we should take off the masks of, you know, I, I, I align to this pastor. Sometimes, actually, we don't even align to God, but to the man of God. That's dangerous. That's dangerous. It's already a losing battle a step. You ought to align to God. So the marketplace takes all of those masks of denominations, of us. Everything gets funded from the marketplace. Churches to be constructed like this beautiful auditorium, it takes you to work outside, make the money, and bring it so that the construction commences. So the funds come from there. So why don't we go there? Why do we wait for them to come? We should go where the funds come from. And then we make disciples, all the businessmen, we need to tell them about God. So they start making kingdom wealth to fund kingdom projects and so on and so forth. Number four, as I, that's the second last bit, I guess. What are the Christian-inspired business practices 
for transformation. We are now going a bit practical. So like you've seen the, uh, the marketplace ministry demonstrates that ministry is not only confined to the walls of the church, but can thrive in the marketplace, influencing society and fostering community through Christ-centered business or work models. And this transformation can be realized with the following consideration. There are quite a number of them, but we just quickly go through them. What are the practices to be transformational in your marketplace? That's what I'm asking. Number one, biblical principles in your work space or business. You can be an employee or you can be an entrepreneur, name it, business owner. You ought to understand business principles, biblical principles in business. The Bible, though it's ancient, provides timeless principles that can guide modern business practices. For example, in Colossians 3, 23, 24 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. If I asked us to just think about that verse, and the things that you do every day, that deal. You find that actually some of these words are just rhetoric. We just read them. Are we working as if we are serving the Lord? You know what that means? It can even be over time. It can even be without pay. It can even be many things. If I would tell you a part of my story in a minute or two, there's a time when I was the associate pastor that is uh, from 2016 to about 2020, at the beginning of COVID. And, and you know, being a pastor, uh, I was associated but more administrative, meaning that I have to f understand what goes on in the church uh, before the, the weekend activities. So the weekly activities, I'm concerned with them. And I served there five years, but in the fifth year, it coincided with COVID outbreak. I had no doubt God was telling me, move. Middle of COVID, no cars moving, no nothing. Jobs have closed. People have lost lives and have lost livelihoods. But I'm like, no, you're going away. So I had to talk to my wonderful uh, senior pastor. I tell him, you know what? I, I can't do this anymore. Because you're young, uh, I think then my eldest child was what? Six years, about six or five. I had a very young family. And uh, I said, are you out of your mind? So he told me, no, think about it. Uh, we shall give you six months to think about it, you know. The, 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 the length was that long so that probably I'll make up my mind. And I told them, you know what? If you would want me to take this six months, of course it was still COVID. That was in, in June of 2020. If this is the case, I'm going to use these six months to train a person who's going to take my place. So I'll be available. If you, you pick such a one, I'll work with them. Interestingly, I also involved the elders of the church. Interestingly, they, they never picked anyone to train. I think there were, especially the senior pastor, was wishing that I would change my mind. So six months came, and they elapsed, end of 2020. And then in January, it begins, February, until actually I had to talk to one of the elders. I told them, you know what? He told me six months. Nothing has changed. I need to go. So I think they realized, you know what? Uh, they wrote me an acceptance letter. Now, I'm saying that to show you that one, I took a part of listening because sometimes God also speaks to us in this way. Sometimes we think God, the voice of God only brings peace. You ask Moses, he tried to debate with him at the burning bush. I tell him, no, you ought to go. When I go, what do I tell him? There are times when that will come. When God is telling you, I'm taking you to another level, it's going to be a bit of discomfort. The long and short of it, I, I come full volunteer 
at intercessors for Uganda. Then, uh, then the person who was heading the prayer department was going to stand for political office. So they asked, may you come and be, you, you be the standing. That was 2022, actually from 2020 towards the end. And I did that role for three years, voluntary, no payment. Meanwhile, I have children and a wife and bills to pay. You cannot beat God. Then until the fourth year, that's when I, I got that assignment as the deputy national coordinator and the, and the work I do today. Of course, that was the year they really put me into the job. Uh, but the deputy national coordinator job also is a bit administrative. Yeah, you sit down and make sure things work. I worked there for a year until I realized that there's a bit of, you know, there are people God created to sit and make things flourish. And the opposite is true. There are people God created that make them bad to make things flourish. Now that will beat your education systems because they tell us go to school and get yourself a job and a wife and children, you know? So I realized that mine is really not confinement. Now that's a personal thing. So I'm not saying it's a doctrine we should pick. There are many things that I'm able to do with, without confinement. And then there are people who will flourish and make things work because they are in one place. That's just a bonus. I didn't plan to tell, tell you that. But I'm just telling you that even in this journey, there are decisions that you're going to make that are painful, but because God wants your assignment to go that direction. The Bible has a lot of examples of that, of that kind of thing. So business principles are supposed to be uh, very, very much employed. Number two, justice and fairness. Proverbs 11, one states, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Downtown Kampala, I'll use that because I worked there. It has all sorts of businesses and all sorts of people. By the way, the first time I saw people having stashes of cash uh, is uh, when I was working with this, my friend, he would, he would trust me with taking money to the bank. By 10 o'clock or 11, you would have like 25 million. And for me, it was such a very big shocker because, I mean, who sees 25 million, uh, you know, in one place at such an early time of the day? But that was not even shocking enough. You would go into the lines of those Chikubo banks. Oh my. People have starches in bags, backpacks, sacks. They're all in the queue going to, <laughs> going to, to bank. Like, wow. But even for that, I know so much that goes on down there. They have these quotes in scripture, give to Caesar, what is Caesar's? You know, of course, they flip it. And then they serve something like, you know, be as, as wise as a serpent. You know, <laughs> I know, <laughs> you know, Pastor, you really are very familiar with it. We use be wise as serpents, a bishop sharp, yeah? Don't be a father, bishop sharp. You know, all of those are flipped. And I would actually see many Christians struggling down there. They are playing by everybody else because if they don't play like them, it won't be fair on their side. So they actually short circuit. Uh, um, 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 if it's taxes, there's a one who actually I knew instead of, I would say this because it's many years ago and <laughs> please don't follow this rule. You know, they're supposed to pay, I think about 32 million in tax, but they got somebody who said you bring 24. And that happens a lot. Now, to God, that's not a biblical business principle. And that foundation is terrible. And you're not going to cause transformation. It's going to give you very temporal happiness. But no sooner you go off the stage, it will crumble. That's how good things work. So fairness and justice are very, very important for you to transform. Let me quickly finish up like this. Number three, generosity for the needy and care for the needy. Uh, that's one of the things, and I thank my sister here, the Seven Hills. I, was, I came here a little early and I was asking them uh, what's up with going on because there are many people sitting here. 
so that the, it's a ministry that is opened up to the community. You know, every Saturday they come, they share with them material with the word and so on and so forth. That is transformational. If you want our communities, if you have a, a church as good as this in a community like that, for those people to say that's our church, you open doors like that. Same with our business. If you want people to know that this person is doing this, have an arm where you take care of the needs of the disadvantaged. Jesus said, these you will have with you forever. You cannot exhaust them. So please always consider if you want to sit